Hello, everybody. Welcome to Profiling Evil Live with Mike King. I really appreciate you taking time out on a Friday afternoon. I slipped out for my lunch break. Wanted to just take a minute and talk a little bit with you, but I want to jump right into it. So thanks for uh, joining up. I want to bring in a special guest today that I've asked to join me. I think you'll all remember Patty Arthur. She's a lawyer with the Anderson Law Group in Salida. Uh, if you think back, Patty and her colleague David uh, joined uh, me and Chris actually uh, on a discussion of conservatorships and 501c3s. Uh, back when all of some wacky thoughts were happening. So, Patty, welcome. Thanks for taking a moment. Thanks, Mike. Good day. <laughs> yeah, it's really great to see you here. And uh, folks you. are just streaming in. But, Patty, I've had something that's been kind of troubling me a little bit. I found some information uh, posted anonymously, uh, but it was it was uh, found out on the, the Reddit sub. And uh, it's a private Reddit sub. And it was some information about the Suzanne Morphew Hope Foundation and also some information that I've been kind of looking at for, uh, gosh, over a month now in regard to some documents leading up to the Puma Path home sale. And I just didn't want to theorize without having some real backing up behind me. So I thought I might just ask you a couple of legal questions about 501c3s and stuff like that. Okay. So let me uh, let me pull this up and we'll get we'll jump right into it. Uh, and you know, I think uh, one thing that is probably worth uh, mentioning is is the fact that uh, today is actually uh, Suzanne Morphew's birthday. And I I don't know. I think there's going to be uh, a, a little event in Salida tonight. Some uh, releasing of balloons or something like that around 7 p.m. But uh, um, I, I I don't want to take away from from Suzanne's birthday, but I thought this was kind of the perfect timing because we're just now about a week away from the one year anniversary of when she disappeared. And um, something that I have found that was uh, kind of interesting to me uh, had to do with the sale of the Puma Path property. And I wanted to just show you a couple of documents here. So I have to stop that screen and pull up another one here uh, real quickly. And uh, I want to talk through that. So uh, <laughs> the it, and, and this these are some documents I found. Uh, it's all public information, but it's documents that I found online regarding the sale of that Puma property. Uh, and this really goes back now uh, to two and three years now, uh, to when the uh, property was originally purchased. It's a warranty deed, but I was so troubled. I don't know if you've had a chance to, to look at these documents, but this was a well permit for the property. And I'm wondering how it ever made it through and got a documentary document stamp and a, a notary stamp and it's missing signatures. This is absolutely amazing to me because not only did the buyer miss it, the seller missed it, the buyer's real estate agent missed it, the seller's real estate agent missed it, the title company missed it, the person who notarized the documents notarized a blank signature line. And in Colorado, when you notarize a document, you have to get your little book out and get the person's driver's license and compare the signatures and write a few things in in their little notary booklet. And then not only that, the clerk and recorder of deeds office notes that failed to notice it. <laughs> I'd like to say pre uh, COVID, maybe there were some infections going on, but this is pretty wacky. I mean, how many people is that that I listed? Five, seven? Missed all that? I mean, there was no stopgap for any of those, the real estate agents, the buyers, the sellers. But the one that is amazing to me is the how do you notarize a blank line when you have to collect that information and put it in your little notary booklet? You have to get yeah. their driver's license. Uh, the, 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 this was That was troubling to me. Now, I don't know that it uh, is the end of the world, but... Um, it's I not the end of the world. That, it just 
wonder how it happens. Yeah, that was kind of later corrected. I want to kind of fast forward to February of this year because then all of a sudden we saw uh, some property starting to move. And this was when everyone was kind of online a little bit concerned about the fact that the Puma property was up for sale. There were concerns because, and again, folks, I hope you'll go back and watch the video. I'm talking with Patty Arthur, a, a lawyer with the Anderson Law Group in Salida, about some of the kind of twists and turns that that seemed a little interesting to me. But originally, we did a video with them a few months ago in where we talked about conservatorships and 501c3s. And David actually talked about some of the challenges of, of them trying to get a conservatorship in uh, Colorado versus Indiana. But now all of a sudden we see some things start happening, uh, property being sold. We were getting the word that, that the Puma property was sold and, and also that a piece of property that I remember being searched when Andy had his army of searchers out there um, was also sold, the Longhorn Ranch property. And I wondered what your thoughts were on that and kind of how things are moving back and forth. I don't have any thoughts one way or the other on that. I mean, sales happen. It was, I see you have noted there are $15,000 loss. So that would have meant that it was purchased for 165000 And if I can recall, I think that was purchased by Barry alone after he uh, after Suzanne's disappearance. So that's why we don't see her on the deed. Um, so Kent Townsend is one of the developers of this property. So it was sold back to Kent uh, as vacant land for uh, what you noted. I, I, if it was 165 originally purchased for $15,000 loss. So, but you know, it happens. Well, yeah. And I mean, there's nothing with the landowner buying back that property. It's a great no. uh, business move. The thing that was happens. interesting to me is kind of this liquidation that's starting to happen. And and again, I don't know, there may be a thousand reasons for that. But then I went on, Patty, and I found another document that was kind of troubling uh, from March 3rd of this year. And this thing uh, is a warranty deed correcting that original document that we were talking about where there was no signature. Um, I, I don't know. Is there even anything to discuss about that? Well, it this type of deed, uh, what they did was they just made a straight up warranty deed for a $10 consideration. You can see it's a few uh, lines underneath your top red line. It's not the way I would do it. I would do a correction deed. Uh, and not do it this way because essentially this just makes another sale for $10 like the original sale never happened. It's not the way I would do it. I would put into a correction deed some explanatory material, but just because it's not the way I would do it does not mean this is not correct if a title company buys off on it. If your title insurance company buys off on it, then this is just you know, that ship's already sailed. It's it's not a big deal. That's what it comes down to. Just because it's not the way I would do it doesn't mean it's incorrect. Yeah. So, so I mean, that's a really good point is nothing illegal here. I mean, it's just no. a little odd no. what, what's happening. Well, here's where I thought things kind of got interesting is then all of a sudden on that same day at 2.08 p.m., just a few minutes later, um, there is a um, guardianship uh, document that's created. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of talk through, talk me through this? Yeah, this is, um, this is the exact same situation that David had discussed. When you have a guardianship or a conservatorship from another state in Colorado, they've made it very easy to recognize that you don't have to go through the whole rigmarole with the courts a second time. All you do is present, uh, the original, uh, award of guardianship or conservatorship from the original state along with this form. Now, if you scroll down, you can see uh, in the lower left-hand corner, there's a little number there that says JDF892SC. So this is something that happens on a frequent basis because it has its own JDF form. It's a judicial form approved by the courts. So all you do is take the original 
uh, guardianship that was awarded in the other state, complete this form and uh, file it with the courts. You don't have to go in front of a judge. You don't have to do anything. I'm not even sure there's a filing fee. So the courts accept it. They put a stamp in the upper right hand corner of it and you can see the stamp up there. And the other thing that is unique about Colorado is Colorado is one of those states where automatically all guardianships and conservatorships do not appear on the ICCES system. They're, they're not suppressed. If it's suppressed, you would see a pink line across it on the ICCES system. That's We call it ICES. It's the uh, Colorado court filing system that attorneys and judges have uh, access to. And it's if it was suppressed, there would be a pink line across it that says suppressed. These are actually sealed. So the only way you have this document is because of your upper uh, circle up there. It's a recorded document. Lori Mitchell is our clerk and uh, recorder of deeds. And so this is a document that must be recorded with the clerk and recorder of deeds office. And then it appears in the chain of title, which people can have access to its public information. Uh, so it, you have to belong to a subscription service for it. Attorneys generally have that as a matter of course, especially if you do real estate work or probate work. So that's why this sealed document, and it doesn't even have the right, if you look, it's just a hand stamp up there. It's not even an electronic stamp that we would have in the ICCES system. So yeah, that's right over there. There you go. So the only reason we can see this as a public document is because it was recorded in the chain of title for the sale of the Puma Path house. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Any questions on that? No. Did I go no, too fast? Um, that, that was interesting to me. Of course, then there are some follow-up documents also that just go on to. That's the original, to that's the original guardianship document. Yeah. That's the second page. It's page two of two that was recorded. Now in the court system, that's sealed, but in the clerk and recorder of deeds, it's not sealed because that is public information. And that's why it ended up then floating around out there is because yeah. it was recorded publicly. Correct. Yep. Okay. So, so then I, I just found this kind of interesting. Um, this was, uh, Almost with six minutes later, I've indicated here, six minutes after all that happened, sure. then all of a sudden the sale for the Puma property goes through. Uh, again, sure. nothing illegal, but uh, interesting how it just kind of stacked up and and uh, happened. Yeah, what happens there is uh, somebody takes a stack of documents down to the uh, clerk and recorder of deeds office and they just go through and file them. They have several transactions they do at once. So wow. okay. um, that's what that's all about. What was well, the sale and, price on? Um, and then I think just to kind of wrap up what, uh, then finally we, we see now with the conservatorship, uh, then we have a legal, the legal authority to sign for Suzanne. So. Okay. What was the sale price on that? Just out of curiosity. Um, let's see here. 1.625 million, which if I if I got the numbers right, because I wrote down a note here, it was about 50K of profit over that period of time. But I would think probably a loss overall with improvements that were made on the home and and uh, realtor fees, if if the realtor was paid fees, which I can't imagine they would have done the work without. So mm -hmm. in all, I mean, um, the, the, again, and, and there have been uh, public announcements of why that home was being sold. But in a market that we see right now where, you know, people are selling uh, their trailer for great money, that, that seemed kind of odd to me. Yeah, it's right in the ballpark there if I know that house. Um, and I do know that house, but that's that's right in the ballpark. Um, I would say it was probably sold at a little bit of a loss, you know, if it was hung on to for a little while for another summer season when all yeah. the weekend warriors come out here. Well, so that's so, right in the ballpark. Nothing funny there. Yeah. So, so then I wanted to look at, and I'm, I'm going to just pull this up. I wanted to look at, um, uh, again, thinking back on this private Reddit sub where uh, I discovered this information. Uh, again, this is a, a public 
document, but uh, maybe you can talk mm -hmm. me through this. There were a couple of things about this that I found really intriguing. First, on the left-hand side, this is just simply uh, a reminder of what the document is. And, and um, there was some information redacted on the Reddit site. I went through and redacted a few other things because I just don't think it's necessary. Sure. But it's about the Suzanne Morphew Hope Foundation. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to shoot right over here to, uh, oh, I wanted to, well, um, and, and the reason why I called you, Patty, is right here uh, that, that this was the paperwork for a 501c3. Sure. So I found, uh, there we go. Let's see here. Sorry about that bouncing around a little bit. Um, I found a couple of things, if I can settle my uh, hand down here, that were kind of intriguing to me. Holy cow. I'm going to try this one more time, Patty, and then if I can, I'm I'm going to go really slowly. Uh, on the form itself, the, the form, I think it's a 1023, there's a whole bunch of stuff that was omitted, and and I don't know if you've had a chance to see this or not. I I did. Um, a colleague of mine who I believe is on that private sub called me the other day and you know bought me a free lunch, which I'm always happy to have. Uh, <laughs> being a pilot, we'll take anything for free. Uh, so uh, he and I went over over this. Um, and he had some questions about it because he does mostly real estate and doesn't delve into the, the matters. But if you want to go to the left, I want to bring up a couple of things there uh, on page one. Circled in red, you have the uh, up at the upper left hand corner, cir okay. circled in red, you have a IRS date stamp. That's August 1st, 2014. If you look to the next column down, you'll see that the effective date of exemption is August 15th, 2012, which is two years earlier. The reason for that is that is the date the organization was originally incorporated in Indiana, I believe. Um, and so what IRS does is it may take them a long time to get something approved, and I'll explain that in a minute. But what they do when they award uh, public charity status under IRC section uh, 501c3, they award it retroactive to the date the organization was originally incorporated, not the date that they actually stamped it. Because they, and this is really technical, uh, a number of years ago, something called the advanced ruling process was eliminated. And so if you can determine, if you can prove to IRS that you are going to be awarded status as a public charity and not a private foundation, then they will award you status as of the date of the filing of the application. They've even gone one step further than that. They've gotten better at it. They're awarding it all the way back. They're trusting you that your activities are great all the way back to the date you first incorporated. So that's why there's a discrepancy there of two years. Um, if you take a look further into the documents, there's a postmark stamp uh, IRS received the application uh, April of 2013, and it took them until August of 2014 to go ahead and get that approved. Now, back during that time period, they were swamped as they are now. Uh, so that is not in uh, that's a little bit longer of a time period uh, that I would expect. But it's within the six month range, give or take a couple of months, either side of that. So August to April for a long form 1023 is about right. But again, they award the status all the way back to 2012, assuming that all your activities from the date you were born, in other words, your corporation was born and incorporated in 2012 are public charity activities. So that explains that discrepancy there. So, so that's really kind of an important thing because I've been kind of trying to theorize when all of these pieces in a timeline fell into place and Suzanne's mother dies in 2013. So um, that, that happened. This corporation was formed before her mother died. There was no shenanigans that it, it, it was uh, something that they were trying to do, I think out of the goodness of their hearts and, and uh, at least, it I think so. Early. Yeah. Um, so as, as we go over here, again, this, this was kind of troubling to me. Is this a big deal that there are so many things missing? I mean, we just saw that in. <laughs> so if you scroll um, up a little bit, so that, that the ones that you have circled there, 
It says, do not file this form unless you can check yes on lines one, two, three, or four. So she checked, they checked line one. And so if you check line one, then you don't have to check two, three, uh, four, or five. So it says one, two, okay. three, or four. Okay. Now, have you filed bylaws? Yes, they checked that. Um, these, does that make sense? Yep, that does. Okay. So this next section, part three, yeah, that is wild. Uh, <laughs> but this um, this should have been filled in. But back in uh, 2013, 2014, IRS was uh, basically rubber stamping a lot of these 1023 forms. So if the basic entire package of the application met all their requirements, um, regulatory requirements, if there were a handful of boxes missing, they pushed it through as long as the whole application in chief met the regulatory requirements. And, and I did look through, I did look through these documents uh, when I was visiting with my, my colleague and the whole application package in chief did meet the regulatory requirements. So while somebody who was very, very familiar with these forms and did a lot of them would absolutely blanch at the idea that, this, these boxes were left unchecked. Um, IRS sees it, you know, they, they see it. And there's a couple other app, a couple other boxes throughout the application that were not filled in correctly. And so all that says to me is that the individual who completed and filed this form is not someone who files these on a regular basis. You know, maybe they've done a handful of them in their career. Um, in my office, I'm kind of nitpicky about things. And if a paralegal or one of my subordinate attorneys that I supervise let something like this go and filed it, I would not be very happy with them. And it would become a teachable moment. Uh -huh. um, but again, you know, there's nothing illegal, immoral, or unethical about leaving a few boxes unchecked. People do it on their own tax returns and then they get skate right through to. Yeah, I'd hate to have every document I've ever created uh, yeah. scrutinized. Now, I, I found it interesting because um, here we see a title of director, but I, I found it interesting as this document goes on that it changes to CEO and president and other kinds of things. Is that normal? No. Um, but I think what happened there was um, Mr. Mr. Barry didn't really – wasn't really kind of what aware of what his maybe official title was and being a person who I understand is in the business world. Um, he just may have used these titles and again, nothing illegal, unethical or immoral about it. It's just, just the way he entitled himself. I mean, technically you would have to have a meeting of the directors and have minutes of an organization. And then you would, uh, approve these titles and all that. And maybe they did that. That information is not publicly available. Yeah. So again, nothing odd there. It's not normal in my world, but I could see it happening. Yeah. I actually, I actually tried to, to find um, the corporation minutes, but learned that, that it, you don't have an obligation. No. To file that no, They're not publicly available. Other kinds of things. Well, I found this interesting and that was just what uh, the foundation was set up to do, which I think were just fantastic, laudable things. First is uh, I, I found, but I found it kind of interesting where these things were happening first in, in Kitwe, Zambia and, uh, or Zambia. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, but anyway, to go toward a uh, village missions orphanage and also toward Central Africa Baptist College. But but the thing I found with all of these laudable goals what was that what the foundation was going to do is just uh, bring clothing and hygiene kits, which I, I don't quite understand the need to create a foundation to do that. Now, the second foundation, I mean, the second location was in Hermosillo, uh, Mexico, and there they were going to do kind of the same thing: clothing and hygiene kits. And I, um, and you know, there's really not a lot of need to to pick through this one by one, other than I wanted kind of your thoughts on that because all of the goals listed here are really laudable goals. But but then maybe we can focus on this question here in a minute when you, you get a minute to respond to that. 
so I I go to a um, evangelical Christian church, and they have missions in other countries, and uh, a lot of people donate uh, great amounts of funds to these missions. Uh, they the folks come from the other countries and they talk, and we have programs, and it's really a wonderful thing that they've done over the years. Um, it seems not, I wouldn't even go so far as to call it odd that they wouldn't just donate money to, I'm assuming the existing missions in their Baptist church, I think that they had in Indiana and uh, why they would go forward and set up a brand new uh, public charity to do this. But then again, Mike, maybe, maybe they just wanted to do something nice. You know, Suzanne had suffered from some health issues and, you know, her mother was going to die a year later and, and people's emotions during these, you know, these kinds of times, they want to, they want to set something up on their own. They want to run their own sort of nonprofit and it, and it gives, um, it, it gives memory to their, their relatives and things like that. And so while the efficient thing to do would be to go ahead and, and just give um, uh, a big donation in somebody's name to the, Central African Baptist Church, there's no crime in somebody wanting to set up their own foundation and going out there and, and doing things. There's there, that, I mean, I see it all the time. So Pretty I don't, I don't really reality, think isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, right. Now, is, is there anything weird about just, uh, I, I, it looks like just normal language to me, but corporation doesn't anticipate paying compensation, but it leaves the door open that we can. Yeah, I do that all the time. Okay. That's the standard language I use unless I have a, a, not a, a charity that comes in and they want to immediately start paying a compensation package to uh, an executive director or uh, board members. It's unusual for board members, but that's standard language that I use all the time. I just leave the door open. So, you know, the, the cop in me can never not dig into things. So the, the next thing I uh, want to do is, is I, uh, I wanted to reach out and, learn a little bit more. So not only was I looking up these documents and again, everything I've done folks is public record. Um, but uh, I reached out to contacts that I have in the Zambia police through the international chiefs of police association. I reached out to central Africa Baptist university. I reached out to VOH Africa, which is again, volunteer groups there. Uh, the mission of love community college, uh, <laughs> global outreach. And, and, uh, and I asked them all, do you know this foundation? Do you know the people? And uh, and my response is back. Two responded, uh, no, they did not, and uh, did not receive any from any others. Again, does it mean anything? Doesn't, doesn't mean a thing. Um, but I found it really interesting because um, as many YouTube creators do, I had a phone call from some people and that's kind of what caused me to start looking toward the foundation a little bit. And they said, just keep in mind that um, there's some great hunting in Zambia and in Hermosillo. And I, I found that kind of interesting. And I'm going to leave it there without saying a thing. But other than the fact that I thought that was interesting, and I, and I did find some beautiful uh, hunting websites in those locations. But I could have probably found some really great, you know, pizza places or other kinds of things too. So it doesn't necessarily mean anything, but this really troubles me here. And I want to get your sense on this is I started looking at, oops, excuse me. Uh, all, well, I'm going to just leave it at this, all of the tax returns. Okay. Okay. And I'm kind of troubled because if this thing was started in 2012, actually got really rolling in 2013, how come I can't find a tax return for 2000? 13, 14, 15. Okay. So the answer to that is a because the uh, uh, public charity status was awarded retroactive to the date of the incorporation, which was 2012, a 2012 tax return would have been required. A 2013 tax return would have been required. 14 and 15 as well. Now, if you look on the Internal Revenue Service website, it's called TEOS, T-E-O-S, Tax Exempt Organization Search. When you enter this organization's EIN number and you bring up the data on it, 
it says 990, 990EZ, 990T, or 990PF. None of those documents, those tax returns, would have been required for this organization. What would have been required for 2012, 2013, 14, and 15 would have been the 990NE postcard. Now, back in those days, IRS didn't post the filing of the 990NE postcards. Now, what that e postcard is, is for organizations who have less than $50,000 of average annual gross receipts per year. It's a simple e filing. And so, those returns would have, in my opinion, been filed for at least some period of time between 2013 or 2012, I'm sorry, and 2015. Because if they weren't, the IRS would have revoked their tax exempt status for failure to file for three consecutive years. So my guess on this is, is that the 990 NE postcards were filed for at the very least, maybe 2013, maybe 2014. They just weren't posted. So that would be my guess. The only other option would be it slipped through the cracks. And I've seen that happen maybe like once or twice. But when they changed the algorithm a few years later, all that got snagged. So I'm guessing what happened was they 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 filed an e-postcard and it just didn't show up in the system. Now, again, you can skip two consecutive years of filing. You can't skip three. Yeah. If you skip three, your tax exempt status gets pulled and there's a way to get it back. There's the easy way if it's only been recently pulled. And then there's the hard way if it's been pulled a little bit longer than 15 months. So um, so that's the answer to those questions there. I'm guessing they filed the postcard because they didn't have a lot of money coming in that was under the 50,000 mark. And so they were eligible to file it. It just didn't get posted on the IRS TO system. So... <laughs> Um, is there a loophole there? I mean, could, 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 uh, you know what? We're going to leave it at that. Um, I, I just worry about whether money could be received and used and never reported. Correct. That, that is, that is correct. But if you look at the 2016 return, it does have some information for a prior year. Now, what's a little confusing to me is these are, uh, dollar figures in the four figures, for 2016 and 2018, I'm wondering why they're filing that long form, the longer form EZ and not continuing to file the 990 NE postcard. I'm just wondering why uh, they're not, why they're spending the money on filing these long forms. Is it for transparency? Did they go to a new accountant? I mean, if you're eligible to file the e postcard, it takes two minutes, do it. And none of your financial records are made public. So is there a loophole? I don't like to call it a loophole, but um, in using the vernacular, I would say yes. <laughs> tomato, tomato. So now we've gone to 2019 and 2020. Who knows? It could have been filed. But I guess the, the reality of this is because I, I've – I've worked on 501c3s before or looked at the documents. Three years and you're you're in the penalty box if you go three years without filing. Yeah, 2020 is not due until May 17th. It's not due yet. Okay. And 2019 and 2020, I'm sorry, 2019, they're still in that. If they go ahead and... They can skip, they file 2018, so they can skip 2019 and 2020. They just have to file for 2021. You can skip two years. You can't skip three. And and if I closed out a 501c3 today, how is there a responsibility to report how I liquidate the assets? No. Um, where that falls is in your articles of incorporation, you have to have diso uh, specific dissolution language that tells where the um, uh, the money's going to go. It has to either go to a governmental entity or another 501c3. Okay, it can't go to a person's, you know, business or something like that. It has to go, that's specific. That's, that's called organizational and operational language. 
otherwise known as purpose and dissolution language. And that's very specific. And um, I'm guessing uh, there are, well, there, there are articles of incorporation would have to have that language in it in order for this application to have been approved for public charity. So uh, if there's a little bit of money left in that, it has to go to another 501c3 or a governmental entity or as decided by a court of competent jurisdiction. Okay. So, uh, Counselor, hold that thought for a minute. I want to say I've been kind of troubled by a GoFundMe account that was created and never expended for searches and other things that I'm aware of, at least looking at the numbers, they continue to grow, not to bleed off as, as expenses are paid out. Could that roll into a 501c3? Sure, why not? So with that in line, and again, maybe there's even no sense in um, answering this question other than it's just my wacky mind thinking. If I had assets in a 501c3 and I have section four that says I'm not paying my officers, but I guess I could pay them if I wanted to, could I liquidate the money as a, as a salary? Yes. That's, that's troubling. But anyway, you, you can, and it has to be a reasonable salary. Otherwise it's classified as something called an excess benefit transaction. Would something in this dollar figure range be caught up with? Nope. Wouldn't even be on the feds radar. Although with the changes in the tax code coming up, it might be with the $5 billion in enforcement uh, <laughs> that the government's now doing, providing for IRS, they gave them an extra $5 billion to up their enforcement efforts. So <laughs> yeah, maybe it would get caught up with. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But a dollar well, figure in no way am I suggesting there's anything um, nefarious going on. No, I, I, I think I, that I, beautiful woman set this up to do the right thing. I, I don't see, I mean, Mike, I see so much stuff in the nonprofit world every day. This is something that wouldn't even, you know, I would look at this document and say, well, you know, a couple boxes weren't checked, but pfft, so what? It already got approved, it, you know, and, and we're not talking about huge dollar amounts here. And, and uh, I, I think you're I think you're right. And I hope the public out there doesn't uh, try to turn this into something that it's not. Yeah. You know, the, the, the nonprofit and tax exempt world was described one time by a well-known person whose name I can't recall as mysterious and drudgerous. <laughs> and I don't think that there was anything. I think like you said, this lady wanted to do something good and it might've been a dream of hers to have a nonprofit and run a nonprofit. And I think that's all this was is. Yeah. When, Patty, when I was a kid, we had a game where we, laid all the cards out on a table up face down and you got to see the cards real quickly, but then you could call out and say, now find that card. And you, and you had to turn every stone over. And as you turned over the stone, sometimes the puzzle became a little clearer because it reminded you of an association. Sometimes you solved the puzzle. Um, what I hope comes from this is that just simply what I think YouTube creators should be doing. And that is, without wild speculation, continuing to remind ourselves not only of this missing person, I mean, it's a great time with an anniversary, but that if somebody out there knows something, don't call me, uh, don't even call the counselor here, call the Chafee County Sheriff's Office and say, man, this has been eating at me for a long time. I want to share this and help them in uh, bringing this thing together. Uh, I, we uh, we this week had uh, the uh, new DA join us on a podcast, and and uh, I, I wanted to just say, kind of as we as we finish talking a little bit, that that the DA is going to be on actually at six p.m. Eastern today. We're going to play that um, podcast, the video portion of it, and I hope folks will uh, tune in and hear. Linda Stanley's approach to cold cases and circumstantial cases. And you've heard me bang the drum about circumstantial cases a lot of times, Patty, but 
uh, it takes an incredible amount of courage for a lawyer to put on a circumstantial criminal case. And uh, But we've seen it starting to happen in the 11th district uh, just recently with, with Alan Phillips. Uh, we saw it with Kelsey Schelling and Dante Lucas. Um, that's pretty exciting. Uh, I, I don't know. Any thoughts about that? I wish Linda all the best. I was not a fan, and I will say this publicly, of the previous district attorney. Um, I have no problem saying that publicly. And I wish Linda all the best. She has a law enforcement background, a keen mind, and it's what we need in the 11th Judicial District to get some things done. And I have no problem as an attorney in the 11th Judicial District stating that publicly. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I hope if you get any time today uh, that you'll you'll listen in if you haven't heard the podcast yet. And folks, Monday night for choir practice, the DA is actually going to join me as my co-host. So I'm really excited about that. That's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to we're going to be talking to the Arizona Majority Whip, Le, uh, Leo Biasucci. And uh, um, I'll just give you a tip on this. Patty, really cool thing happened down there. Uh, Leo put forward a bill that was signed by the governor about three weeks ago now. The bill puts a mandatory life sentence on child trafficking cases and child sexual abuse cases uh, that reach a certain criteria. Um, really powerful legislation that's going to help a lot. Uh, but uh, but anyway, I, I just am so thrilled that you would take time today to jump on and chat. I'm going to give you just a kind of the final word, anything you'd like to add about this whole discussion we've been having today? I, you know, I, I think the thing that's most important to me is that on, on, and I'm not on social media, I'm not on Facebook or any of that other stuff, but I do watch YouTube, but I, what's most important to me is that the facts get out, not speculation. There's so much speculation that I have seen in this Ms. Morphew case that it boggles the mind. <laughs> and I mean, I live here. I live here. And the things that people put out there on, on, on YouTube channels and other sorts of things are not factual. I just want the facts to be out there. That's all. Well, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your trust in, in what we're trying to do on this channel. Uh, tonight at 7 o'clock, they're going to release balloons, I think, in the downtown park area. Anywhere you are in the world, folks, if you want to release a balloon or just pause for a second and, and uh, give Suzanne a thought and a prayer because I believe in the power of prayer and, and maybe that will lead to big things uh, happening. So, um, And to, to the mods that, that helped cover today, Thank you so much to all of you for joining on. Thank you, Patty Arthur, uh, Anderson Law Group. Thank you so much. Uh, I know you've got a busy schedule, but I can't uh, tell you how much it means to me. All right. Thanks, Mike. Good to see you again. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. Have a great day.